All right. So um, yeah, welcome to the session. This is um, uh, this is a session about QGIS. We've got some great talks lined up here. So uh, my name is John Bryant. Um, I'm based in Fremantle, Western Australia. Um, I've been involved in organizing Phosphor-G events in Oceania, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Islands for the last four years. Uh, and I work with open source geospatial software at my company, Mammoth Geospatial. Uh, here in Fremantle. And uh, yeah, super excited about the talks we have lined up today. We've got six talks from uh, QGIS experts in Europe and North America, and they're going to talk to us about plugins and metadata, field data collection, uh, COGS, AI, and about QGIS itself. Um, so first up, we've got Kurt Menke, who's going to uh, talk to us about the very best new features of QGIS 3.x, uh, uh, which I'm sure is a highly anticipated talk by this audience. So. Um, the talk is pre-recorded, but Kurt's actually joining us here today in from Denmark, um, and he'll be answering questions at the end of the talk. So uh, please add your questions to the Venialist platform. Um, so yeah, I'll queue up the video here. And yeah, so Kurt's standing by. So add your questions to the chat or to the questions in the Venialist. So here we go. Hi, my name is Kurt Menke. And I'm going to be talking about the very best new features of QGIS 3x, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. And for those of you who remember me being based in the United States, a lot changed during the pandemic for a lot of people. And um, it was the same for my wife and I. We decided to move to Denmark and moved here in January. And so I'm now based in Denmark and I work for a fabulous open source geo company named Septima based in Copenhagen. And I want to spend a little bit of time framing this talk. I'm coming at this in part as an author. So in the spring of 2019, I published a book on the left named Discover QGIS 3X, a workbook for classroom or independent study. And later that fall, I published the book on the right, QGIS for Hydrological Applications, Recipes for Catchment Hydrology and Water Management with my colleague Hans van der Quast. And one thing I do as an author is track new features to assess when I need to begin thinking about updating these books. So now I'm going to break out of this presentation for a second and bring up QGIS to finish framing this talk. OK, so here I am in QGIS. And I have layers here that represent the release schedule of all the versions of QGIS since um, 3.0 with um, long term releases, you know, having their longer time frames and then the other releases in between. And we have the indicator in the indicatrix space that shows that these are temporal layers. And I'm gonna activate the temporal controller panel and start, uh, start, so start animating the display with time. And so as I do so, you can see you get some nice um, time-based symbology as um, each version is highlighted. And you can also um, see this is when Discover QGIS 3X was released right then, right before 3.6 NUSA. And if I continue playing this, we're going to see a green box appear. And this is going to be the period that we're going to cover in this talk. We're going to start with features um, that were released about a year ago when 3.14 was released, and then cover 3.16, 3.18, and 3.20 ONSA. So to prepare for this talk, I poured over the visual change logs and made a categorized list of all the biggest new features developed in the last calendar year. And it's simply impossible to cover all of it in one 20 minute talk. So I'm going to cover a mixture of features that are likely to be popular and some that just I think might be easily overlooked and um, need more attention. So we're going to start with the browser panel. And one of the nice features here is that with 316 Hanover, the fields are exposed for layers that implement connections API, so different database fields. And so with those, you can go in and right click in the browser panel and delete columns. You can also right click on the fields indicator and add new columns right from the browser panel. So this is not only gives you a nice ability to see what kind of um, fields are contained in a layer, but also allow you to work with those fields a little bit as well. And for each one of these slides, I have a little banner up in the upper right that indicates which version of QGIS this feature was um, released. 
Moving on with the browser panel, it's also now possible um, to right click on a folder in the browser panel and set the color. So this is really um, useful to tag folders. It helps you know, aid um, navigating complex folder structures and things like that and find important folders easy. A nice GUI related feature is that the map canvas now has a right click context menu. So currently you can use it to capture coordinates or uh, select features. And I'm sure there'll be more um, functionality added to this context menu um, in future releases. I think a really exciting feature in QGIS uh, that has been developing over the last year is being able to navigate using the locator bar. So at QGIS 316 came the ability to paste um, an OpenStreetMap formatted URL into the locator bar, and QGIS will zoom to that location at specified zoom level. You can also go to a coordinate with a coordinate pair separated by a comma. And in 320, the nominatum geocoder has been incorporated into QGIS core, and you can now paste an address and interact with that nominatum geocoder through the locator bar. So to show you how this works, we have um, a URL from OpenStreetMap, paste it in there, hit enter, and QGIS will zoom to that spot at that zoom level. This also works for other mapping APIs like Google Maps and Open Layers. You can also go to coordinate. And here I'm going to um, use the nominatum geocoder. I'm gonna paste in the address of my office at Septima in Copenhagen. Um, it finds that, I select it, and it zooms to the, the point where my office is located in Copenhagen. Moving on to the attribute table, um, it's now possible to select some features and control how you open up the attribute table. So I can open up the attribute table now looking at just the selected features on the map. I can choose to just open visible features in the attribute table. I can also choose edited and new features. Um, so here I have selected and visible features showing up in the attribute table, so it's filtering it. Um, so this is a really handy, convenient feature. And this is a lot of what I'm finding in the last year is Qt is just becoming more user-friendly with lots of um, GUI-related enhancements. One thing that um, it's kind of been hidden, I think, in QGIS for years is color vision deficiency or color blindness previews. So on the left is what this looked like up through 316 with several um, simulated color blindness previews available. Now at QGIS 318, that's been replaced um, with the same methodology used in Chrome and Firefox with um, four different previews for different kinds of color deficiency. So to show you what those look like, here we have a, a map that has some greens and reds in it, which are uh, often um, cause problems for color deficient map readers. And so we can see what these previews look like. This is really helpful when you're trying to design a map for um, a colorblind or color vision deficient map reader. And um, you can use this to make sure features have enough contrast between them and the right information is being highlighted um, to someone who has one of these conditions. There's also several new renderers in QGIS. This interpolated line renderer introduced at 320 um, is a really nice one. And I'm gonna show you one great use case, which is this is a, a, a map of a watershed or a catchment. And I have a stream layer with Strailer orders. And I can use this renderer to make the stream network get thinner as it goes out to those lower order Strailer orders, the tributaries. So to show you how this works, I have a little animation here. I can um, choose a simple layer type instead of simple line of interpolated line. I'm then gonna use the varying width option for this renderer. And I have a field in my attribute table for the order, the Strailer order of these streams in this case. So I'll choose that for the start and end value. And then I have um, a little 
box I can check to get the minimum and maximum value, set the minimum and maximum width, and um, then the color of the river network will make it a nice blue. And I quickly have nicely symbolized Strayler order streams. Another interesting renderer is merged features. And this basically does a dissolve on um, a feature in the way it's being rendered. So here I have all the municipalities in Denmark and I use this merged features renderer to make it just one solid color for the country of Denmark. This is one I imagine many have wished for, an SVG symbol search. So now when you go to try to find an SVG symbol, there's a little search box at the bottom that you can use with keywords, in this case, to find a nice train symbol and um, sift through all the different SVG symbols you have for keywords. One of the areas that's seen a lot of improvements in the last year is labeling, especially label callouts. So let's take a look at that. So here I have some airports with simple lines as callouts. I can also set those to be Manhattan lines. And now I can set those to also be curved lines. And with a curved line, there are data defined overrides for the label position and the beginning and end of the lines. I can also set the curvature of those. So I can set them up to be just as I need them to be. I can also now choose balloons as an option for callouts. And here I can choose any kind of fill style. I can set the margins for my labels. I can use the corner radius value to round the corners of those and the wedge width to control the wedge of that. And one nice new feature that's been added is also a context menu in the layers panel that allows me to toggle my labels off and on for a layer. There's been other labeling improvements that I just don't have the time to go into, um, such as dashed lines. Um, but uh, I encourage you to go through the visual change logs and explore that. One of my favorite features in the last year is custom legend patches. So here's a map, and I'm going to set um, a contours patch for this contours layer. And you end up with a very intuitive legend using these legend patches. Another nice feature that has developed in the last year is gradient color ramps for legends. And so for elevation data, for example, you can, um, it'll automatically put that in as a gradient ramp that you can um, modify the, the length, the width, the orientation, the labels of. And there's a blog post down here that I wrote on using QGIS legend patches, if you're um, curious about that, it's in English. And there's also um, a nice GitHub QGIS legend patch repo here where you can download um, user contributed legend patches. And most of these came from that, that you're looking at here. So of course the style manager has also received some attention in the last year. So now there is a legend patch shapes tab that you can use to manage all your legend patch shapes. And you can have these for points, lines, or polygons. These can also be created from geometries of actual features. So that's a really nice um, aspect of this. And I cover that in the blog as well. Another style manager update is that there's a 3D symbols tab now. These don't get previews, but you see your symbols there. And there's now a browse online styles button in the lower left that brings up the online repository for um, user contributed styles. And you can download any of those and, and use them. So now I'm going to turn my attention to the print composer. There's now a setting in the item properties for your map object in the print composition that allows you to clip your map to a shape. So here I'm adding an ellipse to my map and I'm going to then select the map and on item properties for my map, there's now a clipping settings option. Now if I select that, you know, first there's an option to um, handle clipping for Atlas features. But we can, I'm going to choose clip to item and choose my ellipse here. And it's going to clip my map to that ellipse so that I can get an elliptical shape map instead of a square. Continue with the print composer. Another nice feature just introduced is dynamic text. And this is something that was always possible with expressions in QGIS. But now there's a nice dynamic text drop down with lots of options so I can 
um, for example, go down and add the current date. And there's some common formats there. You can modify those by modifying the expression, but it sticks it in um, for you um, so that you can, if you want to modify it from there, you can. There's lots of other options on that dynamic text drop down. Moving on to processing. If I go to the history of processing, processing history is now organized or grouped into time periods. And there's also icons in there for the different kinds of tools that were used. So this makes it a lot easier to find you know, that raster algorithm you ran last week. Another processing feature that I kind of missed, this came out with 3.14, is that you can append output to an existing layer. So there's all the other um, options there, but now with processing algorithms, you can um, just append the output to an existing layer, which is, I think, a really exciting feature. There's, of course, a lot of new algorithms in processing over the last year. Cell statistics is one I think is very nice. Um, there's one for the nominatum geocoder, which I discussed earlier, for batch processing addresses, um, export to spreadsheet. In the expression engine, there's been you know, several nice new expressions. Um, and like main angle, here I'm also showing it, you know, with 314 came the ability to preview um, the results of an expression to see how that's working. And one thing that just happened recently is in map layers, there's now icons that indicate the kind of layer that that is, whether it's raster, table, point, polygon, line, et cetera. And probably one of the most exciting features in the last year is point cloud support. So in QGIS, if you open up the data source manager, you can choose um, an EPT file, which would be a cloud-based point cloud, or a file-based LAS, LAZ file, and bring either of those into QGIS. Here I'm going to cover point cloud rendering. They often come in with just the extent, which can be nice to show where the point cloud is located. Here I'm changing it to attribute by ramp, which I've chosen to be the Z value or elevation. Here I'm choosing the RGB renderer, which in this case has um, RGB colors from an Aerophoto. And finally, the classification attribute, which classifies the point cloud into different objects. So there's quite a few different ways that you can choose to render your point cloud data. Again, we have attribute by ramp, RGB, and classification all available. It's also possible to bring your point clouds into 3D. Uh, there is a 3D rendering tab here that you need to be cognizant of. You need to set the 3D rendering of your point cloud independent of the 2D, but then it will come into 3D um, already recognizing the elevation, and you can then start working with that scene to create fly-throughs and 3D scenes. So it's, it looks fantastic, and um, it performs really well even with large point cloud data sets. There's also been quite a few enhancements to the 3D environment in general. So here I'm looking at the LiDAR data set and choosing to show shadows, which can really help bring out some of the features, as can eye dome lighting. So these are two different techniques you can use to try to dis help distinguish features a little bit more in a 3D scene. It's also now possible to export your 3D scene so that you can bring in that data into a program like Blender to work with it more. So um, some, and there, there's been other changes in the 3D environment as well, but these are some of the most um, probably commonly used and powerful ones that um, I've worked with so far. Okay, so the last thing I wanna cover is not a new feature, it's a plugin. I think it's a notable one. It's the raster attribute table plugin. And this allows you to open up um, and work with raster attribute tables within QGIS. So here, this is land use, land cover data that I have. And when I have um, an attribute table for a layer as a sidecar DBF, for example, I can right click on that layer in QGIS and it will automatically pick up on it and it'll give me the option 
of opening the attribute table for that raster. So um, in this case, I have red, green, and blue values that QGIS recognizes, and I can use this plugin also to classify my data. So here I have class names and I click classify, and it switches from the, the simple black to white color ramp to a palleted unique values rendering with all the colors stored in the attribute table of the raster, giving me a really nice rendering. So this is a fantastic new plugin that I hope one day um, will make it into QGIS Core. Thanks, that's my talk. I'm sure that there are features that um, people are interested in that I didn't have time to get to because there's just so many and so many uses of QGIS. So um, if we have time for questions, um, maybe we can get into some of that. This is my contact information. Um, again, I work for Septima. There's our website located in Copenhagen, Denmark, and I can be reached at kurt at septima.dk and on Twitter at geomenke. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, you're on mute there. If you want to unmute yourself, yep, we can get into some of the questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was that's amazing. There's so many new features. That's pretty wild. Um, I don't know how you keep up with it all, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a challenge for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's just jump into some of the questions. So um, question number one is uh, with the new raster color ramp legends. Uh, raster color ramp legends. Is there a way to label along the ramp so you don't just have a min and max value shown, but values shown along the color ramp? Oh boy, that's a that's a good question. Um, I've only seen the option for min and max so far, um, and I, I'd have to dig into it again to see if that's in there somewhere. I, I don't think so, but um, it may be. Okay. Um, so next question is nice point cloud features. How to handle big point cloud data in QGIS? Any any thoughts about that? Um, well, I know one, one thing QGIS does when you bring in any um, point cloud data set that's in LAZ or LAS format, it, it converts it to EPT. And um, EPT is um, you know, designed to handle streaming um, cloud-based um, point cloud data sets. And I think that might be, um, is, is part of the, reason QGIS is handling large point cloud data sets so well is um, I think putting them in that EPT format is the, is the key. Yeah, okay. Uh, is the raster attribute table savable to the GeoTIFF RAT, uh, raster attribute table? Um, I, I think um, it recognizes as far as I've seen um, sidecar DBFs um, that have the same prefix. Um, so I, don't think that is possible. It, it doesn't. It just recognizes a sidecar that has the. It's sitting alongside the the raster, so I don't believe it will do that. Okay. Um, what else have we got here? It's a good question. So has QGIS now the possibility to create an automated overview map of print layouts? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by automated, yeah. but um, it, there, it is possible in a, in a print composition to have um, an overview map, a second map in your print composition and use map themes to control one, you know, so that you have one overview map and one main map, and, and then you can put an overview there to highlight the area covered by the main map in the locator. So that, that's yep. been possible for quite a while now. Yep. Um... Here's a question. Uh, this is a good one. How do you keep up with all these changes between uh, your feature talks? Where do you find out about them? How do people how do people stay in touch with what's what's the latest and greatest in QGIS? Well, I think one thing um, that I do is is like I said at the beginning, go through the visual change logs when there's a new version. Uh, so you know, in in a month or so, we're going to have three two two coming out. So I'll again go through the visual change logs and see what what the f new features are that pertain to the work I do, especially. Um, so that's what I recommend. And then obviously all the the normal channels um, for you know staying in touch with things, Twitter and the um, you know other online venues. Yeah, there's so, so many channels, so many channels. <laughs> <It's>, yeah, <laughs> but the change logs yeah. I think are the key. Yeah. Um, here's a here's a question that's gotten a lot of votes. How about the 4.0 release? And also, I mean, I'm wondering um, even uh, the upcoming long-term release. Any any. So 4.0 4 first, and then I guess the, the upcoming one as well. 
Yeah, I, I haven't seen any news on 4.0. You know, that would probably be um, due to some kind of, you know, API break with um, an, another version of Qt. And I know there's been some discussions around issues related to Qt. I don't know if that will any of that will um, evolve towards a 4.0 release in the next year or so or not. Um, yeah. I, I haven't I haven't heard. So I, I don't think it's imminent. Um, yeah. probably in the next couple of years, I would imagine there'll be a 4.0. How about, so how about upcoming releases? Any, any features you've got your eye on? No, I actually honestly haven't had time to look at, um, what's coming out in 3.2.2 yet. I haven't really, um, just spent the, the required time to dig into, uh, um, GitHub and see yep. what, what's going on. Fair enough. Um, yeah, there, we've got another minute or so here before we better, well, we better start wrapping it up, but maybe one more. Um, uh, is there a command to make LAS file to EPT? So is this something you can do manually well, Q, in QGIS? QGIS, or? QGIS automatically converts it to EPT when you bring it in. So you'll see an EPT folder in there when, when, you, when you add that. So it, it happens already. Yeah, okay, so it's automatic. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I would I would say that there are you know, just to wrap up. There's a couple of things I didn't have time to cover that maybe I can talk about now. Um, yeah, we've got a one, minute. One being you can right click on a layer now, and there's an option to open up layer notes, and you can you can have notes about that layer stored in in the project, um, and so you can form format them with um, you know all the the normal formatting tools. So that's kind of a, a cool feature. Um, and I know there's also been a lot of work with metadata. So Q just now automatically sucks in metadata from shape files and file geodatabases um, into a QGIS formatted metadata. So um, I think those are some really nice features along with, um, with um, if anyone uses mesh data, there's a, there's a ton of new algorithms for mesh, exporting mesh into various formats or various aspects of mesh data and also the ability to create tins now um, mm. in QGIS. Cool. So yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Kurt. Very much appreciated. That was a, that was a great talk. And yeah, all right. Th thanks again. Yeah. All right, see you around. See ya.